below, and welcome to the Huntsman Corporation second quarter 2024 earnings call and conference. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. If anyone should require operator assistance, please press star zero. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. You may be placed into question queue at any time by pressing star one on your telephone keypad. We ask you please limit yourselves to one question and one follow-up, then return to the queue. It's now my pleasure to turn the call over to Ivan Marcuse, Vice President of Invest Relations and Corporate Development. Please go ahead, Ivan. Thank you, Kevin, and good morning, everyone. Welcome to Huntsman's second quarter 24, 2024 earnings call. Joining us on the call today are Peter Huntsman, Chairman, CEO, and President, and Phil Lister, Executive Vice President and CFO. Last night on August 5th, 2024, after the U.S. equity markets closed, we released our earnings for the second quarter of 2024 via press, re- press release and posted it to our website, Huntsman.com. We also posted a set of slides and detailed commentary discussing the second quarter on our website. Peter Huntsman will provide some opening comments shortly, and we will then move to the question and answer session for the remainder of the call. During the call, let me remind you that we may make statements that, about our projections or expectations for the future. All such statements are forward-looking statements, and while they reflect our current expectations, they involve risks and uncertainties that are not guarantees of future performance. You should review our, our filings with the SEC for more information regarding the factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from these projections and expectations. We do not plan on publicly updating or revising any forward-looking statements during the quarter. We will also refer to non-GAAP financial measures such as adjusted EBITDA, adjusted net income, and free cash flow. You can find the reconciliations to the most directly comparable GAAP financial measures in our earnings release, which is in, which has been posted to our website at Huntsman.com. I'll now turn the call over to Peter Huntsman, our Chairman, CEO, and President. Ivan, thank you very much, and thank you all for joining us this morning. I find myself in a rather precarious place this morning as I usually prepare some opening comments the afternoon before these calls. Over the last 24 hours, swords have been rattling in the Middle East, triggering massive potential for raw material volatility. And over the past few hours of trading, trillions of dollars, yens, euros, and RMB have been wiped out, and consumer confidence has been reforecasted more times than the polling data for the upcoming presidential election. All of that being said, after five quarters in the chemical industry of massive inventory adjustments, plummeting margins, and a tidal wave of Asian-based oversupply, these most recent events seem quite calm. Our cost initiatives that have been ongoing for the past three years are paying off as we've stayed ahead of inflation. Our focus on cash generation delivered over $50 million of cash flow from our operations in the second quarter. As we outlined plans in the previous earnings call, our volumes year over year and quarter over quarter were up across the entire business by 9 and 8% respectively. This volume improvement took place as we were able to increase margins and earn what we projected from our previous call. While I continue to be concerned with Europe's highly successful policy of deindustrialization and excess chemical capacity flowing out of Asia, the single largest catalyst for margin improvement for Huntsman would be a resurgence of commercial and residential construction demand. This will not fully happen until interest rates drop below their current levels. I believe that events in the past few weeks have increased the likelihood and timing of a rate decrease. Presently, third quarter order patterns seem flattish to the second quarter. We remain cautiously uh, we remain cautious regarding the second half of the year. The present time is simply too early to have a clear picture of the fourth quarter. That being said, inventory in the supply chain remains low. Our construction, aerospace, infrastructure, power, and elastomers businesses continue to improve. We will stay focused on cost and cash management is our priority. With that, let's open the line up uh, for any questions. Thank you. We'll now be conducting a question and answer session. As a reminder, we ask you please ask one question, one follow-up, then return to the queue. If you'd like to be placed in the queue, please press star 1 at this time. If you'd like to remove yourself from the queue, please press star 2. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. 
Our first question is coming from Michael Sisson from Wells Fargo. Your line is now live. Hey, good morning. Uh, nice quarter there, Peter. Um, it, it, in terms of uh, MDI energy operating rates, I think last quarter you noted that you know, we were at the cusp potentially of getting you know, better pricing. I think you said operating rates are in the mid-80s. Any, uh, any thoughts of where we're at now in July and, and how, that, how you think that's going to shape up as we head into um, – uh, the rest of the rest of the second half. Yeah, it's it's somewhat of a squishy number because there's not a lot of reliable uh, data that's transmitted in real time. I would say that we probably have seen a few percentage points drop in Europe, probably a few percentage points uh, tightening in Asia, and the Americas uh, basically, I'd say, stayed flat since the second quarter. Um, I'd say that, that in the second quarter, we probably were in, first going into the second quarter, we're probably in, in the mid-80s, uh, on, maybe a, on the weak mid-80s. And I think now we're probably still not mid-80s, but perhaps a few points stronger. Um, uh, overall, I think trending in the right direction, but uh, moving along ever so slowly. Got it. And, uh, you know, you did, you did mention if, if there is a, an improvement in, in construction demand longer term, it's the, big, the most important earnings driver for Huntsman. Um, any thoughts where you think uh, you've had a lot of cost savings, where you think polyurethane's EBITDA can get back to in the event that um, hopefully demand resurges over time? Well, I, I certainly see, you know, given that if, if we get back – uh, into to kind of that normalized construction uh, that, we, that we're looking at the mid to upper mid teens uh, sort of margins with polyurethanes across the board. Um, you know that that will that will require I think three basic things to take place. I believe that China will have to see a little bit uh, stronger growth than we've seen the last year or two. Um, we'll have to see Europe at least start to get some traction and, and uh, you know, in a, in a, uh, a, a, a low sort of uh, percentage growth rate in an industrial basis. Uh, you kind of remember that, that they need to be moving from a tourist economy uh, back to some element of, a, of an industrial economy. Uh, and then the U.S., which I feel is, is, is in a, a recovery phase right now, uh, we need to see that housing come back. Those three basic things uh, take place. I think you see urethanes back into that mid-teens uh, plus sort of margin basis. Thank you. Next question today is coming from Jeff Sikoskis from J.P. Morgan. Your line is now live. Uh, thanks very much. Um, your volumes were up, you know, 8, eight or 9%. Uh, you, your inventories were down about 10%. Um, what, why is that? I, I think that, that we've, uh, we've, we've tried to manage cash as, as carefully as we can. Uh, we did have a plan, as we announced uh, three and six months ago, uh, to, to try to recover some of our uh, volumes that we have lost. I, uh, I don't think through error, but we certainly lost some volumes a year ago trying to hold on to pricing and uh, demonstrate pricing discipline. Uh, we did give up some of the the larger, particularly around uh, insulation, composite wood, some of the more polymeric commodity sides. We also saw a lot of de-inventorying that took place in elastomers, industrial applications, and so forth. So we've gotten some of that volume back. We've seen some regrowth taking place in some of those applications, and we have seen a lot of the de-inventorying taking place. So. I think it's just a, a, a uh, capital discipline um, around uh, supply and demand in production. And, Jeff, just on the numbers, our volume in inventory is down 4% overall. Be correct. If you calculate that on a DIO basis, we're down about, about 10%. And as Peter says, that's just a, a real focus on our, our inventory levels that we, that we have right now. Do, do you think your working capital will be um, – a use of cash this year, or a, a benefit to cash on balance? Yeah, I think I, I think Jeff, that's going to come down to to uh, to revenues in the final quarter. I think we'll control our inventories pretty well. I think in general, those will offset with payables as we get to the end of quarter four. 
uh, and I think it's going to come down to, to, uh, to receivables and just the level of activity that we see in quarter four this year versus versus last year. Um, and as we said in the prepared remarks, we've probably got about $100 million of year-on-year free cash flow benefits outside of any movement that we see in working capital, uh, and, and that's our focus. Now, I will just note, uh, in addition, uh, the, the, the lack of de-inventorying that we're seeing uh, this year versus last year is giving us a little bit better uh, predictability in, in, in supply and demand orders and so forth. Thank you. Our next question today is coming from Patrick Cunningham from City. Your line is now live. Hi, good morning. So the polyurethane guide is, you know, calling for flattish EBITDA quarter on quarter, despite maybe 15 to 20 million in discrete headwinds and relatively stable volumes. How should we think about, you know, variable margin improvement throughout the quarter? And if there are any particular regions you want to call out that, you know, might be stronger than others? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's, it's largely going to be flat. I mean, there'll be, there'll be some give and takes. Uh, you know, we, we experience an outage in our Rotterdam facility in which we're just now starting to, to restart the facility and coming back online. We've got to rebuild some inventory there. Uh, we'll see a little bit of headwinds on uh, the Chinese joint venture that we have around uh, propylene oxide. And, uh, you know, we hope to see some some volume growth and pricing momentum that continues into the third quarter. And I think some of that's going to be offsetting each other, a little bit of seasonality. Um, th- that will uh, that'll mostly be taking place in, in uh, performance products in the, in the third quarter. Uh, so, yeah, I think a lot of give and takes, as I said in my prepared remarks, uh, it's probably going to be pretty flattish. Well, one item to consider, Patrick, on the bridge for polyurethanes from Q2 to Q3, uh, we will we will aim to have an inventory build towards the back end of quarter three. We've got a uh, turnaround in the fourth quarter. That will necessitate some inventory build, which will give us a, a one-time benefit on EBITDA, which will reverse out. And that's probably between 5 and $10 million, which, which will reverse out in the fourth quarter. Understood. Very helpful. And then you know, with price mix down 10% year-on-year for advanced materials, were there any areas of structural pricing pressure, or was this mostly mixed impacts? And if you have any detail on how we should think about it for the balance of the year, that would be helpful. I, I think that virtually all of that uh, is mixed. Uh, demand uh, trends continue to be to be very strong in advanced materials, very solid, and we're seeing the gradual recovery of, uh, of aerospace. Uh, I do mean gradual, because there are to continue to be played with some supply issues. Um, in aerospace, but by and large, uh, it's, it's been a very consistent, very reliable uh, end of the business. Thank you. Next question is coming from Vincent Andrews from Morgan Stanley. Your line is now live. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Peter, in your, your prepared remarks, you made a comment that uh, lower interest rates, you're not so sure, would actually improve um, your operating environment in Europe. I was wondering if you could just color that in a little bit. Uh, no, I, 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 okay, well, maybe I meant to, that came out a little bit backwards. I think the lower interest rates are going to particularly impact North American construction, housing, commercial construction, and so forth. Um, I, I do think that lower interest rates will impact Europe. Uh, I, I just don't believe that it will be nearly as material to the bottom line. Um, we certainly would welcome that in Europe, but I don't think it's going to be nearly as material as it, as it will be in the United States. And is that just a function for you of your uh, exposure being larger to building and construction in the U.S. versus Europe, or is there something else that, 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 that's causing that? Yes. Here? Yes, and I, I think as we look at and we track multifamily, single-family uh, construction, so forth, uh, that, and we look at the uh, we look at the, the housing uh, inventory of how many homes are in the market, how many homes are available go through the, the typical housing data. Um, the U.S., when it rebounds, uh, I believe it's not going to be a very gradual rebound. It, it could be a very sudden and, uh, and, 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 and strong rebound, again, depending on uh, two things, on rate cuts and overall consumer optimism. For, uh, for North America, construction is about a 60% exposure. Europe's about 50, but it's very different, as Peter says. Uh, in Europe in general, it's aligned with commercial construction, whereas in North America, it's relatively balanced, but with a greater proportion of sales into residential. 
Okay. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Next question today is coming from Frank Mitch from Fermium Research. Your line is now live. Hey, uh, good morning. Um, uh, Peter, one of the priorities in 24 was to get the volumes up, and clearly that's been a success. Um, but, you know, price mix uh, in the second quarter uh, faced a very easy comp and obviously came in on the negative side of the ledger. 3Q faces another easy year-over-year comp. Um, how should we think about the progression of price mix in 3Q and, and beyond, and what, what will it take to get it back to neutral, if not positive? Well, it's going to take a combination of, of uh, capacity utilization, overall demand, and uh, and, and mix uh, of the products we're selling. A combination of those three, and as as you know, short of, of a cataclysmic economic event, um, you know, I, I remain bullish that we're, we're going to continue to see a gradual improvement uh, that's, that's taking place in the business over the course of the next couple of quarters. I think price mix was mostly built in, Frank. If you look at the sequential quarter one to quarter two in general, that was relatively relatively neutral. That's right. Yeah, I I I, I did pick that up. Um, and then and then uh, uh, you know North America polyurethane volumes up nicely in one Q, up nicely again here in two Q. Uh, you know, over twenty percent in both both of those quarters. Does that continue in three Q? That level of uh, that level of improvement in polyurethanes North America. Most likely, yes. Uh, again, the kind of basing what you said earlier, we're starting it on a very low basis as to where we were a year ago. Uh, but no, I, I think that we will continue to uh, defend our market share and we'll continue to win back business. Thank you. Next question today is coming from David Begleiter from Deutsche Bank. Your line is now live. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Peter, if the recent drop in oil prices holds, could there be a benefit tailwind to your earnings in the back half of the year? I'd like to think that would be the case, but uh, you know we are seeing areas around uh, refining where we've seen crude prices coming down and benzene prices going up in some cases. Now today's benzene's down to 350-ish as I look at it today. Uh, in the second quarter, it was up around four dollars. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, as I look at, at uh, some of these prices, I, I look at some of the published prices around chlorine and caustic, not that I give those published prices much credence, uh, but, it, you know, you, you are seeing uh, stability in, in certain areas uh, that, that seemingly are, are somewhat detached from, uh, from crude oil. But I think, by and large, uh, falling crude prices should give us some tailwind. For, for, for benzene, David, it settled at 380. The contract for, for August, so it was still relatively high relative to the to the spot price. We tend to pay the the contract price, so it really for us is all about how benzene then moves during the, the month of August and how it settles for, for September and beyond. Very good. And just in advanced materials, Peter, we're thinking about the bridge to 25. Could this be a uh, a sizable uplift in earnings in the segment as? Some of the mix issues and raw material issues get uh, grandfathered and the volumes pick back up? I uh, well, should certainly hope so. I think that, again, we're, we're going to need uh, you know, some, some tailwind in all of the three areas. But as we look at uh, the cost initiatives, pricing, some of the R&D uh, initiatives that will be coming into the market, uh, yes, I, I believe that as we get into 2025, again, barring some major change, it, it uh, ought to be a year of, of improvement for us. Thank you. Next question is coming from Mike Harrison from Seaport Research Partners. Your line is now live. Hi, good morning. Um, was hoping that you could uh, talk a little bit about the competitive dynamics that you called out in performance products. Uh, you said that those negatively impacted margins. Uh, what exactly is going on there, and do you expect that negative impact to persist into the second half? Yeah, well, our, our performance products, mind you, is, is really in, in, uh, in two major product groupings, and then you get into sub-product groupings and geographies from there. That would be our Malay business and our Amin's business. Our Amin's business, uh, it continues to hold up quite well. Malay in North America, again, this would be the raw material going into unsaturated polyester resin and so forth, uh, is, is holding up quite well. Uh, where we're, we're getting hit 
the hardest in performance products is Malayic, specifically in Europe, uh, where we're seeing a, uh, I think the, the, the wording I used was a tidal wave of Asian-based Malayic uh, that, that's going into Europe. Uh, Europe also has very low duties comparison to the U.S. and Malayic. Malayic in, coming into the U.S. has about a, a 20, 28, 29% uh, duty protection, whereas in, in uh, Europe, I believe it's around mid-single-digit sort of, of, of numbers. So, uh, again, getting back to that industrial policy, uh, you know, that we, we look for in Europe and so forth, um, but that, that's, that's really the area of, of, uh, of greatest competition uh, that we're seeing for performance products. All right, thank you for that. And then on advanced materials, it really sounds like this is becoming a, a significant focus area for M&A. Uh, curious what the acquisition pipeline in advanced materials looks like at this point, and, and could we expect some acquisition activity uh, yet to come this year? Well, we're, we're looking at, at uh, that pipeline probably picking up a bit. I mean, I think there's a, across the board, there's a lot of assets right now that are owned uh, by private equity that are kind of getting to the end of, of a multi-year uh, sort of a hold where a lot of these companies, I think, are going to be bringing assets to the market. Having said that, uh, advanced materials is unique in that if we were to go out and try to buy MDI capacity, for example, in polyurethane, uh, we wouldn't be able to, to do that for antitrust purposes. Uh, performance products were already the largest in North America and Malayk and Hydride and so forth. When we look at advanced materials, we see an opportunity both for vertical and horizontal integration uh, that, that uh, really makes it a target-rich environment. Uh, this is a business that I think is a, extremely core to our business. If we, if we want to look at a business where we want the rest of the business to have the sort of earnings profile of a, a 20-ish uh, high teens uh, sort of, of uh, margin, EBITDA margin business. Uh, and I'd, I'd remind you that that business remains very strong in Europe uh, in spite of all the headwinds and everything that we're seeing in Europe. So there, uh, I, I think of, of where we want to be as we continue to, to evolve as a company. I look at where there's a target-rich environment, and all of those would point to advanced materials. Now, having said all that, uh, I do want to emphasize that just because there are a lot of targets out there uh, does not mean that we're, we're going to be loosening up, uh, you know, the, the, the barriers that we're setting up as far as the discipline around pricing, value, integration, and, and uh, what it means to go out and, and actually buy one of these and what the impact that has on the balance sheet. So we're going to remain very disciplined in that pricing as well. Thank you. Next question today is coming from Salvador Tiano from Bank of America. Your line is now live. Yes, thank you very much. Um, first, I wanted to review a little bit the polyurethane guidance because actually I would think when you're taking into account the force majeure or the POMTB turnaround, it looks like actually like for like it would have, you're pointing to much higher earnings in Q3 than Q2. And I'm wondering what uh, is driving that? Is it essentially the U.S. Margin expansion because of the freeport outage and the, I guess the big price increase we saw in May and June, and also how sustainable is this margin expansion as freeport comes back online? Yes, Sal. So you're correct in that we've got the Rotterdam force majeure, we've got a PMDB turnaround. I think we said earlier as well we've got a one-time benefit from what is an intended inventory build towards the end of September ahead of a turnaround in October. Any benefits that we're getting tend to be in PU Americas when you compare uh, quarter two to quarter three, uh, driven by a little bit of volume. But as you indicate, we've also got some pricing traction in the United States with our price increase, which should improve unit variable margins as we go through the quarter. So it's really North America plus those other pluses and minuses that we gave earlier to bridge uh, to bridge the uh, the quarter two to to, uh, to quarter three. Okay, and can I ask also a little bit about the adhesives business in the advanced materials that you highlighted? Um, can you provide a little bit more color there about applications? Is the the box-based adhesives, and also um, what's the difference, I guess, in the outlook versus your composite business? Because I would assume that also that is driven by 
um, aerospace OEM, but it, you know the outlook, as you said, there is much better for this year. Yeah, so, so I think what we highlighted was our infrastructure coatings uh, business in in advanced material. I mean, there's five elements overall to to, uh, to advanced materials: our power business, aerospace, uh, our automotive business, industrial, and our infrastructure coatings business. The infrastructure coatings business tends to be a little lower margin business that drove us down from a price mix combination. In terms of adhesives, in terms of adhesives in particular, that's where we're putting interior applications into aerospace and that has grown for us uh, pretty much double digit during the course of this year it's offset some of the slower growth that we've seen more on the composite sides going into the wide body aircraft uh, and has given us a lot of heart that i think we've said we should expect aerospace to return to pre-pandemic levels during the course of 2025. thank you our next question today is coming from josh specter from ubs your line is now live yeah, hi, good morning. Um, I wanted to ask around your early thoughts here around 4Q and not necessarily pinning to a specific number, but just thinking about seasonality. I mean, we talked about some of the moving parts in polyurethanes and you're seeing some pricing. You know, would you expect seasonality to be normal in fourth quarter? Should that be our base case? Or are there things that you would call out to say why it would be abnormal, maybe closer to stable versus what you typically expect? Thanks. Uh, my, uh, yeah, great, great question. My, my guess is probably as good as any, Josh. Um, I, I would suspect this year that seasonality ought to be uh, pretty, pretty normal uh, compared to the last couple of years, with the exception of last year. Uh, and I base that solely on demand has been has been fairly uh, steady. It hasn't been growing a great deal. It's been, it's been fairly steady. Uh, there's not a lot of inventory just anecdotally that I'm seeing in the supply chains. That's not to say that they're not pockets here and there and so forth, but typically at the end of the year, if you're sitting on a lot of inventory customers and uh, in certain geographic areas of the company will take that opportunity uh, to, to deplete inventories and, and uh, improve their working capital at the end of the fourth quarter. Um, and seasonally, yeah, that, that coupled with seasonality. So uh, from a seasonal point of view, probably 100% chance of certainty that Christmas and New Year's will come about, there will be a slowdown. Uh, as far as will there be a massive drawdown of inventory and so forth, uh, there doesn't feel like there's a lot of inventory in the system right now. I think my biggest concern right now would be between now and uh, the end of the year where you've got kind of a couple of these big macro issues, be they geopolitical issues in the Middle East, U.S. elections and so forth. Consumer confidence, you know, volatility in the stock market, consumer confidence somehow tanks in the fourth quarter, uh, that could have a reverberating uh, impact on overall demand. And I think that, in my mind, is probably uh, the biggest uncertainty that's out there right now. But aside from that, I, I don't see at this point, I don't see a lot of, of areas of, of, uh, of uncertainty and, and supply uh, that, that's sloshing around. Thanks, that's helpful. And I just wanted to follow up on the point around cash deployment. So, you know, while your leverage is higher now with depressed earnings, does that really delay any deployment into buybacks or M&A? I mean, I guess if you have normal seasonality, you're probably still in the fours through the rest of this year. So how do you think about that? I think you're, what the, the cash discipline you've seen in the first half of this year uh, will most likely continue over to the second half of this year. I don't think that there'll be, you know, a lot of a lot of change there. And um, yes, yeah, so we're going to be very disciplined on capital spend. We're going to be uh, spending freely on areas around safety and reliability. That's how licensed to operate. Uh, you know, but discretionary spending and so forth. We're going to continue to be very uh, focused on on uh, limiting that. Uh, if we do M and A, it's, it's going to have to be something that fits very well, that makes a lot of of uh, sense of integration and and uh, shareholder uh, value creation. And uh, yeah, we, we want to make sure that we uh, are able to guard the dividend, the balance sheet. Yeah, and as, as Peter says, I mean, our dividend right now is at 4.5%, so it's pretty competitive uh, overall from that perspective. And you're right, Josh, I mean, our leverage, our net debt leverage is, is, is four times uh, really of, of trough, trough EBITDA. Uh, I think we'd see ourselves at that one and a half billion dollars about that of of, uh, of net debt and 
if you do sort of average cycle uh, EBITDA, uh, that'll that'll bring us down to below our, our, our two level, which is is what we would try and ensure over a, over a cycle. Thank you. Next question is coming from Alexei Yefremov from KeyBank Capital Markets. Your line is now live. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. Peter, I was hoping you could update us on your spray foam uh, story. How, how is your business doing this year, and, and if that uh, business overall is gaining share from other forms of insulation? Well, I, I think you know when I look at the comparison to spray foam versus other uh, products, I, I look at it first from a very macro basis. Uh, and I uh, look at some of the earnings of our peers and so forth, it, it feels like it's a pretty sluggish area of demand right now. And, uh, it, you know, we're optimistic about some of the government initiatives and standards and so forth that have been set and that will be coming in through 2025. Uh, there'll be, you know, the, as, as those standards, tax issues, building codes and so forth uh, really hit the bottom line, uh, I, I'm, I'm quite optimistic about what I see in the pipeline. Uh, presently, you know, the higher crude prices, uh, which is kind of where your polyurethane foam uh, is based versus your natural uh, mineral fibers, which are largely based on energy and uh, natural gas prices, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a competitive market out there right now. Thanks, Peter. And uh, uh, you reminded us of your commercial versus residential real estate exposure in the U.S. and prepared remarks. Uh, I was hoping to ask you if you see any signs of slowdown in commercial real estate and also tell us what, what is the breakdown between maintenance and, and new within commercial? Um, yes, yeah, as, as we look at commercial in North America, just looking at the revenues, um, it's it's really about uh, you know the, on the commercial side, which makes up about 40% of, of our overall business, 45% of our overall North American polyurethane business. Of that, it'll be split about uh, one third retrofit, two thirds uh, new. Uh, again, that's commercial. When I look at residential, that's that's making up of our polyurethane business in in North America on a revenues basis. Uh, that's making up about 55%, and of that, that's going to be about, of, of that number, uh, it'll be about uh, three quarters that will be new and one quarter that will be retrofit. Thank you. Next question is coming from John Roberts from Mizuho Security. Your line is now live. Thank you, Peter. In advanced materials, what kind of vertical integration are you interested in? I assume it's primarily downstream and not going back into the upstream? No, we spent years getting out of the upstream. It'll definitely not. Well, I should never say never, but it'd be a cold day in hell for it for us to go upstream. But I don't know the temperature gauge in hell, so I can't look at that. <laughs> but no, it, it certainly is downstream. It certainly is lateral. I think uh, look at our last couple of acquisitions, and I think we've we've uh, been able to go lateral. We've we've uh, been able to buy some chemistries and so forth that have enhanced our our core business um, in advanced materials and and. Uh, I'd, I'd like to just go further downstream. And then what ha has to happen for the long-term effective tax rate to come down to 22 to 24 percent? Is that just geographic normalization? Uh, yes, it is exactly right, John. I mean, we said 22 to 24 percent, I think, as we move back towards um, mid-cycle uh, EBITDA, you'll see that coming coming, uh, coming down. Uh, we're actually 23% in the second second quarter, so we're 27% year-to-date. But it's, it's, it's exactly that. And what we need to see is a, there's an improvement in profitability in Europe, so ultimately you can use some of those, those NOLs. Thank you. Next question today is coming from Kevin McCarthy from Vertical Research Partners. Your line is now live. Yes, thank you, and good morning. Uh, wanted to ask you, Peter, regarding performance products. Your volume uh, grew 8% in the quarter, and I think in the prepared remarks released last night, you referenced some seasonality, but also modest restocking. And I was curious about that. We haven't heard a lot of chemical companies pointing to restocking. You called out coatings and adhesives and, and fuels and lubricants. So I was wondering if you could expand on that and maybe comment on uh, – your confidence or visibility that it's restocking related versus uh, you know underlying demand pull or green shoots. 
Yeah, Kevin, a uh, great question. I, I think it's I, I think in the last earnings call a quarter ago, I, I said that you know we you've got restocking, you've got demand. Higher demand's gonna participate is gonna precipitate uh higher restocking. And and eventually if you look at kind of the the, the bell curve with it, with each of those on each end, you're gonna get in this gray area in the middle. And that's I think an area where we always struggle. But typically as demand improves uh, you are going to see people's confidence improve and restocking will improve. So I, when I talked about modest uh, restocking, we're seeing modest uh, demand improvement coming back. Uh, a lot of that particularly around some of the ag business and in, uh, in construction business around uh, performance products is going to be uh, around uh, you know, your, your spring planting and, and that's going to be some seasonality in that. That's why I pointed out in third quarter, we'll probably see some seasonality headwinds uh, in performance products. Uh, but we're, we're also seeing uh, a nice return in demand in the fuel and uh, lubes additives. Uh, it reminds you that as we look back on 2023, that was an end of the business that unexpectedly uh, got hit very hard. I, I should say unexpectedly because a lot of that was inventory driven. And uh, I think that we've seen inventories normalize, return to demand, come back, and uh, that was that was a nice area of recovery we saw in this past quarter. That's helpful. And then sticking with performance products, I wanted to come back to uh, maleic anhydride. I think you referenced you know, some of the challenges there in Europe related to uh, import pressure into Europe from from Asia. I guess my question is, uh, do you think that 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 dynamic will improve in the back half of the year, uh, given industry dynamics as well as you know the freight rates from Asia to Europe. One of the consultants, uh, at least I think, pointed to a uh, higher contract price for Malayic in Europe in 3Q versus 2Q. So not sure if you saw that as well or, or what your expectations are there, but it'd be helpful to uh, understand a bit better. I, I have not seen any any uh, any indications in the third quarter so far, uh, and even going into the fourth quarter, they give me a, a whole lot of optimism around pricing uh, for Malayic in Europe. Uh, that's not to say that we're opposed to that price improving. I'm just I'm just not seeing uh, those sort of indications. I, I think it might be more of a 2025 event. Look, you're going to see uh, when you see some of these trade routes. Uh, change and shift between, uh, you know, going up through the Suez Canal versus going around Africa and so forth. Uh, that's going to cause a month or two of pricing volatility, supply and demand, but eventually the product's going to get there, right? So, uh, and and when you start, you know, you should take a bunch of shipments and you put them around Africa versus up through the canal, uh, and you reopen the canal, you can actually get, you can see a scenario where you get too much coming in at the same time. Uh, so I, I wouldn't put a whole lot of, of uh, long-term cure, if you will, around shipping costs and logistics and routing and so forth. Fundamentally, as the Chinese economy improves and Chinese domestic demand improves, more of that malaic will stay in China and uh, will not need a home in Europe. And that will probably be what will help uh, European uh, prices more than anything else. Thank you. Your next question is coming from Hassan Ahmed from Alembek Global. Your line is now live. Morning, Phil and Peter. Um, Peter, a question. I um, just wanted to revisit volumes in the polyurethane segment. Um, you know, obviously, on a percentage basis, you know, strong growth over there, particularly in North America. I'm just trying to get a better sense of, you know, despite, you know, you mentioned that obviously we're coming off of a low base. Um, uh, you know, how far away are we, you know, be it by region, be it globally, uh, from reaching more normalized levels of volumes? I, I think that uh, is on good question. I, I think that, that you've got to see uh, that normalization. Again, we, we need to see recovery in the construction, residential construction uh, markets. And I believe that as we, as we see that gradual improvement take place, it certainly is something that we would hope would have returned uh, in 2025 uh, as, as we kind of get through the rest of this year. 
Understood. And just sort of, uh, you know, carrying on with uh, the construction side of things, you know, obviously we saw the rate cut on the ECB side, and it seems, you know, the uh, rate cut's imminent uh, here in the U.S. I mean, you know, internally, as you take a look at, you know, historic trends and your own sort of numbers and the like, I mean, what sort of lag is there between a rate cut and you guys seeing the benefit from that in your, you know, demand numbers, profitability numbers and the like? I, I think it's probably it's depending on the time of year, the size of the rate cut, and so forth. But you're probably talking about a, a you know two two quarters or so. It's not going to be the next week or the next month. Uh, but but as, as the rate cuts uh, come down, you will see optimism among builders. You will see uh, gradual pickup as, of inventory and so forth as people feel more confident about investing in in uh, the future. And again, depending on the time of season and the size of the cut, uh, you're, you're probably looking at, a, at a, at least two quarters to really see an impact on something like that. Thank you. Next question is coming from Lawrence Alexander from Jeffries. Your line is now live. Hi, this is Dan Rizzo on for Lawrence. Thanks for taking my question. You mentioned being disciplined with uh, with with capex. I was just wondering if you have ample capacity to meet any resurgent needs, resurgent demand that could occur after after rate cuts or if things go back go back to a kind of a stronger restock cycle in in all three segments. Yeah, good good question, Dan. Uh, simple answer is absolutely. We're poised, set, and ready to go. Need okay. any demand scenario. Okay, and then and you also mentioned um, Europe being more dependent upon commercial construction, and the rate cut doesn't have as big effect. What do you think needs to happen from a macro standpoint to kind of again re re energize that that region to to re energize the commercial construction or region or Europe? I, I, yeah, I, I believe that Europe. If, if the question's around Europe. Uh, is, is going to be a, 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 a question as much around consumer confidence uh, and, and uh, rate cuts as it, as it is around uh, anything else. And, I'm, and consumer confidence in Europe is, is largely going to be predicated on, uh, on everything from geopoliticals, but particularly around energy pricing, energy competitiveness, and uh, you know, when you, when you see your utility bills uh, that are going up 40, 50, 100 percent year over year, uh, that's a lot of disposable income that's that's uh, going to pay for a failed energy policy. Thank you. Next question is coming from Matthew Blair from TPH. Your line is now live. Uh, thank you and good morning, uh, Peter. Could you talk about the dynamics on the ground in China for Huntsman System? Is it fair to say that areas like housing and manufacturing are, are slowing? And, and how would you characterize autos in the region? I, I, you know, the auto side uh, continues to be a, a, a strong demand for us. And, uh, you know, we've got a, a lot of very good applications and relationships there with a number of the OEMs in auto. I don't really see an area of decline. Obviously, we've seen areas of decline over the last year, so particularly around residential uh in in construction i don't think those are particularly getting worse we're just not seeing any recovery taking place uh in those areas but by and large uh we're we are seeing uh you know we're, we're seeing things stay pretty steady uh infrastructure continues to be uh you know decent for us automotive continues to be strong uh and consumer confidence and exports i think are, are staying steady Sounds good. And then on AdMat, uh, I think the slides mentioned that aerospace sales are are rising due to interior adhesive applications. Do you have any examples of this? And is this something that only applies to the wide body uh, planes, or are you making inroads into into other planes as well? No, safe, safe to say that it's it's in in, uh, in, in both wide body and in narrow body. And uh, we're, we're seeing a lot of this in overhead bins and in the galley areas and so forth. Uh, when you think of an airline and, and those large commodious uh, bathrooms they have there, uh, all of the, the components and sidings and everything that are, that are glued in there 
It's, it's kind of a new and growing area of application for us. When we think about aerospace for us, it's been a lot of, traditionally it's been a lot around the composite materials going on on uh, the outer shell and wing and so forth. And the interior uh, adhesive applications, these typically take quite a while to qualify for these. And we're seeing, you know, we've, we've been working on that for some time and, and uh, we're seeing, uh, you know, the patience is, is paying off. Thank you. Next question is coming from Arun Viswanathan from RBC. Uh, line is now on. Operator, why don't we have this? Uh, it's a busy morning for a lot of people. Why don't I have this be the last question? And, and uh, anybody else that has any other questions or anything, uh, feel more than welcome to call uh, Ivan or Christine. Certainly. Our final question today will come from Arun from RBC. Your line is now live. Great. Thanks for taking my question. Um, yeah, I just wanted to go back to your earlier comments. Um, now, I understand that the interest rates could help in North America and, uh, you know, m maybe in 25. But, um, again, um, I think uh, Hassan was asking maybe where you are kind of in your normal demand levels. Would you say that you're um, seeing demand at maybe, say, 50% of normal or 60% of normal? Uh, how much recovery would you expect, I guess, over the next – couple years and um, you know what's your visibility on on are there any markers that you've seen recently that would uh, tell you that we're either uh, improving or incrementally or, or getting worse thanks well well we're certainly as we look at as we look at demands and we break that down on a segment for everything from appliances to composite wood to flexible foam insulation elastomers automotive uh, spray foam and we break down on a base by base case-by-case -case basis, uh, as we look at the, 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 our internal capacity around the areas of, of construction, I would say that uh, globally it's going to vary a, a bit. You're, you're probably somewhere in the low to mid-80% capacity utilization in those areas of, uh, of what I would consider to be normalized run rates. So, again, uh, you know, some room for, for expansion, but certainly a lot better than where we were a year ago this time. Thank you. We've reached the end of our question and answer session. And ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude today's teleconference webcast. Let me just connect your line at this time and have a wonderful day. We thank you for your participation today.